So when we're thinking and making and talking about biochar, we can touch on a lot of different environmental topics from waste management to water quality to soil health. It's a climate solution. My name is Lori Lilly, and I'm the founder and executive director of a nonprofit organization called Howard EcoWorks. We're based out of Columbia, Maryland. We do a lot of community building type projects, and that's partly why we're here today um, around empowering communities through demonstrations and training and education. Biochar is really just converting any type of organic material, be it trees, manure, crop residues, through the certain pyrolysis process. Pyro meaning heat, and then the alysis part meaning like separation. We're basically separating the volatile gases from the solid biochar when we make it in a high heat environment with little to no oxygen. So you end up with the charcoal that has a very high intrapore density. So it has tons of little pores inside of it because of the way that it was made. And the surface area is of a piece of biochar is enormous. Because it has all of that surface area, it enables a microbial community to develop in there and interact with the soil to create a really healthy environment. Particularly when it's mixed with compost, it can be an extremely valuable soil amendment. So you can make it at a big industrial scale or you can make it at a smaller scale like we're doing here with this kiln. This is an open bottomed kiln. Um, we've sealed off the bottom so that the oxygen can't get in through the bottom. And then we're gonna make the fire on the top. And as the fire burns down, it makes the coals. Then we're gonna add on more material. The anoxic environment is going to be between the flames and the bottom of the kiln. So the coal is gonna not keep cooking because it doesn't have the oxygen. So when we're, when we're finished, we will put out the fire and we'll be left with our biochar. This kiln has a, a heat shield uh, to make it more efficient. It will burn more efficiently and make more charcoal. As the fire is burning, um, we will get a countercurrent flow up through this heat shield and it kind of like curls back down. So in this manner, we, the fire will burn the smoke. So we should see very little smoke when we're burning the fire. If we are seeing a lot of smoke, we might be adding too much material at a time and we might want to like spread it out and let it burn down a little bit before we add more material. We have our own kiln that's a different type of style kiln that's a square five foot by five foot on the top and four foot by four foot on the solid bottom and it has a drain plug in at the bottom. So you build the fire in the same manner as this type of kiln. Then when you quench it, you undo the drain plug and the water drains out and you have your charcoal. In addition to doing the biochar in a pit, you can just do it in an open pile. It's not going to be as efficient as if you do it in a kiln, but you can do it that way. For selecting a site, we really need an open area. We want it to be flat and level, no overhead canopy trees. We need a water source is the most important thing, which could be a hose. If you don't have access to a hose, you could use some kind of water tank or storage container. You need to be 50 feet away from any kind of structure or building. Another consideration is where your feedstock material is and how close you are to that and whether you're gonna to need to bring the kiln to the feedstock or bring the feedstock to the kiln. When we're managing our waste material and our organic wood waste, we leave it in piles like this so that we can create habitat for wildlife and critters to overwinter, just so we can do a little extra good until we turn this into biochar. A moisture meter is a good investment. We want the moisture to be less than 25%. It, ideally, we would do maybe a fresh cut to get the inside moisture content of that. Or if there's a lot of bark on the wood that you're looking at, you can scrape off the bark and put the moisture meter in. When we make this fire, we're going to start with the smaller material. We're gonna load it up as much as possible. We can even load it a little bit higher than the top of the kiln. And then we're gonna put our kindling on top. We're going to light it and it's going to start burning down. When we start seeing some white ash on the material that's left on the bottom, we're going to add more material then. So we're going to do it in layers. We want to have a nice even fire on the top, ideally. So then every time it goes down, we add more material, wait for that to sink down, add more material. This is ideal kind of situation so that we keep forming layers of charcoal on the bottom. In kind of like the middle part of our burn, 
we'll put the bigger material in and then we'll layer like more medium sized material on top of that so that the bigger material can burn while the next layer of smaller sized material burns. We want to burn it as hot as possible. That makes the best char. We want it to get above 500 degrees Celsius and we have like a heat gun and it will tell us how, how hot we're burning it. So now we can start the fire. This is a propane torch. Um, good investment also for making biochar. It's going. Go ahead. Just light it all around. Another thing is to just be cognizant of your clothing type. You don't want to have any polyester or nylon type materials that will singe. Cotton material is, would be best for the burn. If anybody sees any sparks or lights on the outside of the kiln, we want to spray it down. You can just wet around the perimeter of the kiln to help prevent things from catching. So we're ready to add our next batch of material. We've burned down the big stuff, and what we're left with is a couple medium-sized piles of material. Now we'll do the autumn olive. So we've added all of our material. Now we're gonna let it cook down till we have red hot coals and then we're gonna put it out. Yeah, I, th I think we're ready to put it out because those remaining big pieces that are burning, are um, they're going to take too long. We can just use them in our, in our next burn. So we've, we've worked with two different kiln systems. We, we had the square kiln and, and with a closed bottom, and we have this ring of fire kiln with an open bottom. The quenching part of the process is a little bit different for each. With the square kiln, it has a drain plug. We filled it up like a bathtub, and then we let the water drain out. With this one, we're going to first put out the fire with the hose. As it starts to cool off, we're actually going to take the panels off. We're going to rake out the coals and we're going to spray down the charcoal more until it's fully cooked. So in terms of water, the guidance is on this size kiln, we'll need about 150 gallons of water. You can also like wet the side of the kiln to help cool it off so we can take it apart to it. Yeah, from the inside. Yeah. It's gonna be a lot of steam. And, it, it, and anywhere you see white, you hit that with the water. You want to pull it out? Yep, just yeah, just bring it all the way out. And then the other rakers go in and start pulling it out. See all those hot coals? We want to get those put out, all the white spots. Yeah, get everything as spread out as possible.
I think the ratio is like converting, um, uh, you get an efficiency of like 20%. Like whatever volume of material you have, you might end up with around 20 to 25% biochar, depending on how efficiently you burn it. And some of the things that we learned about are how much biochar you create is really like dependent on how you cook it, what is your feedstock, what type of kiln we're using, all of those different things factor into a little bit about how efficient we are in producing the end amount of biochar, but it's, it's really not, there, there's not a really a, a hard prescription for this. So you can't really go wrong. The only way you would go wrong is if you let it burn to ash and then you haven't made the biochar. So um, it's, a, it's a fun thing to kind of experiment with. The applications of biochar are many. Our interest at Howard EcoWorks is mostly as a soil amendment. Biochar is really good at infiltrating water and holding on to nutrients. So in, for example, like a rain garden or a bioretention facility, the biochar acts to increase the efficiency of the ability of that best management practice to soak up water and to soak up pollutants. If you want to use it in a garden, you want to charge the biochar with compost because the biochar will actually compete for nutrients with the plants. And you can also charge biochar with a liquid microbial inoculant in order to get that microbial activity within all those little pores. Another thing to think about when you want to use it in your garden is, is how you want to crush it to make smaller materials. So again, the surface area is really important. So we want the particles to be as small as possible. We drove over uh, the biochar that we made with a truck. We've also used a tamp to, to crush it. Kelpie suggests using a wood chipper. If you have like, especially like a lot of greens in your compost, like the, the vegetable materials and stuff, adding a lot of biochar to the greens will create a nice biochar mix and it will degrade or decompose faster than if you were to just do the greens and the browns in that in that ratio that you would typically do. The reason for doing it would be like in places like the eastern shore of Maryland where we have way too much poultry litter and the amount of waste and nitrogen that is in the landscape in proportion to like the size of the land, like it's just too much. So in that kind of situation, you can take the poultry litter and on a more industrial scale and create it into this beneficial soil amendment. That's a lot of bio, there's a lot yeah. of bio. <laughs>The mission of our organization is to empower communities and diverse workforces to conserve and restore our natural systems for future generations. We work at the nexus of workforce development and environmental sustainability to build more resilient communities. We offer a number of different programs related to green jobs. Uh, we have a summer program, a seasonal program. We also have a number of different services that we offer around sustainability and sustainable landscapes, and we invite you to Check out our programs and our services by following us on social media and visiting our website, howardecoworks.org.